worship your holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Jesus, I worship your holy name. Worship your holy It's who I am. It's who I am. 
Well, good morning. Good morning. Happy New Year. Excited to worship with you in 2023. We're going to do that in just a minute. I just want to put a few things before you. My name is Clay Munzer. If you uh, haven't met me or maybe you're new here, um, we want to say welcome to you this morning. I'm the associate pastor. Um, love to have you with us this morning. Just a few uh, quick announcements. There is an Awana leader meeting this Wednesday, and it's going to start at 430 here at the church. So no Awana, but there is a leader meeting taking place at 430. There will also be a youth leader meeting happening right after that at about 545. So if you're a leader in either of those, or even if you just want to hear a little bit more about those ministries, feel free to come to either of those meetings. Um, last thing, there is um, a deadline for the Mexico mission trip. If you are interested in going on that trip, the deadline is January 9th. So would you um, find me, go to the Welcome Center after service. We'd love to get you more information on that mission trip coming up. If you are new with us, uh, there's a connection card in front of you somewhere in the pew. Uh, would you take a moment, fill that out for us? We'd love to know you were here this morning with us. Um, without further ado, I'm going to take us straight to Psalm 139 before we worship. Would you stand with us as I read a few verses from Psalm 139 this morning? This will be on the screen for you as well. I'm going to read verses 1 through 12, then we'll pray, and then we will sing together this morning. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is bright as the day, for darkness is as light with you. Let's pray together. Oh Lord, would you search us today? God, we thank you for this new year, for this new day. We thank you for the new mercies that come with it. And we simply ask that you would be glorified. Lord, you're near. Um, no matter where we go, you are near. Even there, the text said, you are with us. We can't escape your presence. So, Father, as we sing, would you receive all glory now? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sing, open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes again. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see you, I want to see you, to see you high, to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy. Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want 
want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high. To see you high and lifted up. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high.
Amen. And then we're going to sing a timely song this morning, the old hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. What I love about the song is it gives us such an awesome picture of God. This is who our God is. He's so good. Um, our salvation is so good that regardless of, of circumstance, we can sing, It Is Well With My Soul. So whatever circumstantial baggage we brought through the door this morning, we can sing boldly, It Is Well With My Soul together. Sing when peace. When peace like a river attendeth my way. When sorrows like sea billows roll. What Thou hast taught me to say It is well, it is well with my soul Sing it as well It is well with my soul With my 
my soul with my soul it is well it is well with my soul amen let's pray father in heaven we give you praise for the truth in that song Our sin, not in part, but the whole has been nailed to the cross. And so whatever comes, we can sing it as well with our souls. You're so good. We love you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated this morning. All right. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Great. Happy New Year. My name is Levi Van Z, and I am one of the elders here at Trailhead, and I have the privilege of preaching in Mark's absence. He is still on his travels. And so I just want to say I'm so excited that you've chosen this morning to be here. You could have started 2023 a lot of different ways, but you chose to be here fellowshipping with other believers. And so great job making that a priority. I pray that God will bless your time here this morning uh, by doing that. Now, by raising of hands, I do want to see who actually made it to midnight last night. All right, great. Okay, good. I'll be watching each and every one of you, making sure that you don't fall asleep. So I was in bed by 10, so there you go. Uh, It's sort of strange preaching on New Year's Day. I know Mark commented last week that it was strange for him to preach on Christmas Day, and so, myself, not preaching that often, this is obviously my first time preaching on, on New Year's Day. So, as I think about New Year's Day, uh, there's a lot of thoughts and emotions that come to mind. A lot of us maybe have considered or already had, have made New Year's resolutions. And so, some sort of attempt to, to improve or better what we do. Uh, a New Year's resolution or resolution is a firm decision to do or to not do something. And so, I looked up some statistics on resolutions, 50% of people want to exercise more, okay? 50% of people say that they're going to save more money this year. 43% of people say they're going to eat healthier. I don't know how many percent are planning on not eating healthier, but I don't want to discourage you, but only about 7% of people meet their New Year's resolutions. 35% of participants who failed their New Year's resolution said they had unrealistic goals. That could be me. 33% of participants who failed didn't keep track of their progress. 23% forgot about their resolutions altogether. No raise of hands. And one in 10 people said they failed because they made too many resolutions. So maybe that's you. Maybe, Maybe you can associate with one of those. And as I said before, I think it's great to set goals to push ourselves and to maintain good health and improve some areas of our lives. I'm not going to come up here today and strategize with you as to how to do so. What my goal for you today is to gain a better understanding of who God is. So as we go into this new year of of 2023, I pray that we would be better equipped for whatever this new year holds for us. Okay. As I said before, a new year can hold a lot of emotions, probably depending on what we experienced in the previous year. If you had great success in the previous year, you might be hoping for more of that next year. If you had trials and struggles, we might be expecting maybe some more of the same or hoping for something different. So how do we approach a new year? Today, again, I want to equip us with God's truth from his word that will prepare us. In order to do so, I want us to open up our Bibles to Philippians 4. Philippians chapter 4, we'll be reading verses 4 through 9. I forgot to look at, see what it is in your pew, what page it is in your pew Bible, but Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. As we're turning there, and I believe it will also be on the board, I just want to give you a little bit of context here. Paul's letter to the Philippians was to be an encouragement. Paul wrote this letter to express his appreciation and affection for the believers in Philippi. He didn't have to write it due to any grievous circumstances, but mostly to express his joy and to guide his readers to find that same joy no matter what the circumstances. 
So please follow along as I read Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. It says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things, and the God of peace will be with you. Would you please bow your heads as we pray. Jesus, we just thank you for this word. We thank you for the truths in it. We thank you for the peace that is spoken of in this text about Jesus Christ. We thank you for bringing us all here together this morning that we can fellowship. Father, we thank you for the new year. We entrust it to you. Whatever it holds, Father, we just trust our lives, we trust this year to you. Father, we know that there's many needs out there. Father, I pray for physical needs. Father, I know there's too many to list, but a few, Lord, just pray for Dave Shears' continued treatment, continued prayer for Don Schofield, prayer for Kristen Johnson recovered from surgery. Lord, pray for Colton Cora White. Lord, there's many other physical needs. There's other many more spiritual needs, Lord, out there that are unspoken of. We just pray that as a blanket prayer, Lord, that you would meet us, each and every individual in here, that you would meet us where we are at. We thank you that you are a God who hears our prayers. We thank you that you are a God who answers our prayers as you see best. Father, we pray for Mark and Beth and their family as they continue on their travels. We just pray for just a refreshed time, Lord, just that they would come back um, refreshed. And Lord, just pray for safety in their travels. Pray for connections, uh, that they would make it back timely. Father, we just uh, thank you for them. Pray that you would just bless them in this time. Father, we just entrust this sermon, entrust this time to you. We just thank you, praise you, and love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to break this text down verse by verse. We're going to start in verse 4, looking at rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Now, as we think about that, it may seem like an unrealistic goal to rejoice always. We'd say, Paul, you don't know what I'm going through. I'm going through a really difficult time. How can I rejoice always? Well, the key words in this are rejoice in the Lord. You see, Paul knew that no matter what was going on in life, no matter how dark life appears, it is possible for a Christian to rejoice in the Lord. Paul's joy was not rooted in the circumstances around him. It was rooted in the truth that Jesus Christ had taken care of his greatest need. It's even fascinating to think that this letter written to the Philippians was most likely written from prison. Paul was in prison when he wrote this letter. How could Paul do that? Well, Paul understood that this was not his home. The prison was not his home. This earth was not his home. In the previous chapter in Philippians, Philippians 3 verse 20 says, Paul's words, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So looking back at the text in Philippians, because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross, no matter what is going on in life, we have the opportunity to rejoice. Now, I'm not going to tell you, and I don't believe Paul would tell you, that everything that occurs in this life is worthy of rejoicing. But through the lens of the cross, in the Lord, we can rejoice in any circumstance. Amen? Why can we rejoice? The next verse, verse 5, says, Let your reasonableness, or in the NIV, the gentleness, be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Or again in the NIV, the Lord is near. Now, some of you, as you were coming in, may have seen on the sign, the Lord is near, and you were excited because you thought this might be an end times sermon. Sorry, I know you're excited about that. I really hope that it's 2023 as well. I hope he's coming back this year. Praise the Lord. But I can't guarantee that or even suggest that. Only the Lord knows. Near, in this case, would be proximity or location, right? A closeness. 
and involvement in our lives. The Lord is involved in our lives. He is what we would call omnipresent. Omnipresent means that he is everywhere at all times, meaning he is near us at all times. Pastor Clay uh, read from Psalm 139. I'm not going to read all of the verses from that, but I'm going to highlight a few. Psalm 139 shows us that God is near. God does care. And Psalm 39 verse 1 says, You have searched me and you have known me. You know when I sit down, when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Verse 3, You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all my ways. Jumping to verse 7, where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I free from your presence? Right? We cannot even get away from the Lord if we wanted to. Verse 10, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. Verse 14 goes on to say, Clay stopped at 12, but verse 14 says, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. The Lord knows us inside and out. He is near. Because of that, we can rejoice. By thinking right about what God is like, by understanding his character, as we see in this text, right? by understanding who he is and what he has done for us, we can rejoice no matter what the circumstances. Verse 6 goes into a text about being anxious and not being anxious. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Paul, through the inspired word, is telling us not to be anxious about anything. Okay? I looked up a few things on the internet as to what causes anxiety. There's a lot of things, but I limited the list to this. Thinking that there's something physically wrong with you causes anxiety. Being worried about loved ones causes anxiety. How much money you have or don't have causes anxiety. Feeling that everything needs to be just perfect. Perfectionism, right, can cause anxiety. Relationships, particularly arguments, and public speaking, preaching, can cause anxiety. As I was preparing for this, I was thinking, man, do not be anxious about anything. And here I am, nervous to speak in front of a group of people. Absolutely. So, um, a lot of things can cause anxiety, right? Beginning of a new year, the unknown. What does this year hold? Past couple of years, right, we've learned that anything can come our way, right? Unexpected things. And that can, that can cause anxiety. Can also, uh, we, might, we might approach the year with, with excitement. But we also, we see that, that the truth of the matter is, is that we live in a fallen, sinful world. And so God here says, do not be anxious. Is there reason for anxiety in our world? Absolutely. Okay, so I don't want to just dismiss that and, and push it under the rug and say, you know what, don't worry about it. And God doesn't say that either. See, he, he gives us this command to not be anxious about anything. But he doesn't just leave it there. He gives us very important tools to be able to handle that and combat that anxiety. Because it's a real thing, right? It is. So what does he do to equip us? He helps us through them by telling us we are to pray. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Scholars separate the two things between prayer and supplication. Prayer would be more like constant communication with the Lord as we go throughout our day, continually in everything that we do, bringing it to the Lord, presenting just a constant conversation. Thinking to 1 Thessalonians 5.16, it tells us to pray without ceasing. So it's more of a lifestyle, right? It's more of just a continual prayer with the Lord. That will help us face situations that would give us anxiety. Supplication is more like specific prayer requests. Lord, help me with this moment. Help me with this particular sickness. Help me with this particular fear. Give me strength in this moment. And so supplication would be more of a specific. He goes on to say, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. What are we thankful for? Well, for starters, 
we can be thankful for who God is. God, we have a God who actually listens to our prayers. I, I can only imagine how many prayers have been lifted to false gods that have no ears and they don't hear, right? We have a living God who will hear our prayers. Not only does he just hear them, he answers them as he sees wisest. Doesn't always say yes, right? We might have some lofty prayers that aren't prayers to be said yes to, but God is wise and he answers them as he sees wise. And so we can be thankful for the God that we are praying to. What else has he done? Well, big picture, right? We know the end result that he has provided for us eternal salvation. So no matter what we're going through in that moment, we as Christians have the hope of eternity. What is the result of this? Let's look at verse 7 here. And it says, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. This peace of God is brought to us because of who God is. Because he's a God who hears us. Because he is a God and for what he has done. This idea of which surpasses all understanding reminds me of the verse of Proverbs. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6 says this, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your paths straight. If you're looking for two verses to memorize in this new year, if memorization is one of your resolutions, I encourage you Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 and Philippians 4, verse 7 for starters. Okay? Good, good truth to keep on our minds. God doesn't stop there. He gives us more tools to equip us to approach anxiety and fears. Verse 8 says this, Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. You see, he's given us a command here to take captive our thoughts. What we think about is a choice to us. We have the opportunity to think about the truths of God's word, or we can take our eyes off the Lord and see the world around us, the fallen depravity of the world around us. God's calling us here to focus on the truth of God and his word and what he has done for us. Amen? Verse 9 goes into this. What you have learned, this is Paul speaking here, what you have learned and received and heard in, sorry, what you have received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Not very many people that I know of can say, Practice these things as you have seen in me. But Paul, he is a good example. In Philippians 3.17, he says, Brothers, join in imitating me. Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. 1 Corinthians 4.16, he again says, I urge you then, be imitators of me. And 1 Corinthians 11.1, 1, Paul again states, be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Paul felt confident for those, for others to follow him, but is he claiming perfection? Absolutely not. Okay, Philippians 3.12 leads us to believe that he's not claiming perfection because he says, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, so he's saying he's, he has not obtained and he is not perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. So Paul is calling people to pursue his, or, or, or to follow his drive and pursuit of Christ-likeness. Right? Paul's not claiming perfection. He's saying, hey, as I follow Christ, please do the same. Follow that. Paul knew that the Lord Jesus is our ultimate example. Okay? And he's trying to point people to Jesus Christ. Verse 9 says, right, says to, to practice these things as you have received and heard and seen in me. As I was studying this, I began to wonder, I said, well, what did the Philippians see in Paul? What did they hear? What did they receive? What was Paul's relationship to the Philippians? And as I dug deeper, okay, it's clear that Paul had a, a great relationship with the residents of Philippi. Uh, Paul speaks here of rejoicing and not being anxious. And so, what was their experience with Paul? 
Well, I want to take us to Acts 16, where Paul and Silas are in Philippi. And this is just a fascinating story that I want to, uh, to, to read with you, to you, and just to show you what was, what, what, what did they actually see in Paul? So as you're turning to Acts 16, we're going to start in verse 25. We're not, I'm not going to read the, the entire section there of, of his experience in Philippi. It would take too long, but I'm going to catch you up to speed in Acts 16. You see, Paul preaches the word, and a woman named Lydia accepts the gospel. Paul and Silas continue to preach the gospel to the people there, and while they're there, there is a young, a young girl who is prophesying, and she's actually making, uh, providing financial gain for her owners as she is uh, actually possessed by, by this demon. And so in doing so, Paul eventually casts this demon out of her, casts out the spirits is what it says, and as soon as these owners of this young girl realize that they have lost their profit, they throw, they have Paul and Silas thrown into jail. So just to start out, another thing that causes anxiety, I think uh, when I think of prison, I, I would think anxiety uh, would be at the top of the list there. So we see Paul and Silas in prison, and what I want you to notice here is what is their response, okay? What is their response? So I'm going to start in Acts 16, verse 25, and it says this. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds, and he was baptized at once, he and, his, he and all his family. Then he brought them up to his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced along with his entire household that he had believed in God. I'm going to jump down to verse 40. It says, So they went out of the prison and visited Lydia, and when they had seen the brothers, they encouraged them and departed. The point of the story is that Paul is writing to the Philippians not to be anxious about anything. You see, they saw the evidence of God's work in Paul's life. When they read this letter, because the book of Philippians, right, it's in, in, our, in, our, it's in our Bible, but it was originated as a letter to a church, to a group of people. When they read this letter, they would have had this context. They would have said, our good friend Paul, our missionary friend Paul, we know what he went through when he was here, and we saw evidence of his, in his life, of God's work. And we saw that, how did Paul respond? He was singing, praising God praising God, singing hymns, and we saw God work through that, even that situation, okay, and, that, and God used that situation to bring people to the gospel message, to know the Lord as their personal Lord and Savior. And so they would have had that, they would have had that in the back of their minds as they were reading this letter. Do not be anxious about anything. Yeah, we, we've seen that before. We've seen that in Paul's life, okay? Did Paul have reason for anxiety? I would say yes, but how did he handle it? He trusted in the Lord. Paul went through some really hard times. I'm going to look at 2 Corinthians 11, starting verse 23. This is just a, a list of accolades of things that Paul went through that personally, I think, would cause anxiety. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 23 says this, With far greater labors, far more imprisonments, with countless beatings, and often near death, Five times I received at the hands of the Jews the forty lashes, less one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea. On frequent journeys, in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from Gentiles, 
danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship, through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. And apart from other things, there is the daily pressure on me of my anxiety for all the churches. Did Paul have reason to worry? Absolutely. But we see in God's word that he trusted in the Lord in each of these circumstances. You see, he trusted in the Lord. And how did he gain that trust? I think that trust is, is something that is it's an acquired trait. It's something that we acquire over time and experience. And Paul saw firsthand the Lord provide for him again and again and again. And so he is able to say, hey, listen, we serve a God who can handle these situations. We can get through these. We do not need to be anxious. We need to trust in the Lord. At this time, I want to give you a couple practical, real life, from my own life, experiences of what it looks like, of what trust and, and gaining trust looks like. Now, anytime, anytime we, we try to make some sort of analogy or, or comparison, they fall short, right? They fall short to our comparison with the Heavenly Father. But for relatability, I want to share just a couple stories here. Last summer, I had the opportunity to go hiking with my family over by Superior, and we decided to drive up to a mountain lake. And the roads over by Superior, the mountain roads, they're pretty smooth, they're pretty good. Okay, so we said, you know, the only vehicle we fit into is our minivan. So let's give it a shot. So we all piled into the minivan, my family and my father-in-law, and we were driving up the road, and I was thinking, that's a pretty good road. But then all of a sudden, it started getting a lot bumpier. And I looked at the road, and it doesn't look that washboarded, but certainly is bumpy. Went a little farther, probably too far, and I finally decided I'd better pull over and check things out. So I got out of the, out of the van, and sure enough, our, our rear tire was absolutely shredded. It was barely there. So this may be where I made a mistake by sticking my head back into the window and saying, oh man, our tire's completely shredded, where it provided a great deal of anxiety into some of the passengers. So, my son, Josh, as many of you know him, uh, I found out at that moment that, that he, was, he was ready to get out the survival tools. He was, he was ready to build a shelter because he thought there was no way that we were going to make it off that mountain that day. It was a great experience for a lot of us to realize that cars have these really cool compartments where they stow these little donut tires, okay? And you, another compartment that holds a jack and wrenches and everything. And so there on the side of the road, we changed the tire, put the donut tire on, and it, like I said, it was a great experience, a learning experience. And why do I tell this story? Well, I think in that moment that my son was able to see, okay, I can trust my dad and see that he has the, the well-being of his family in mind. Okay? You can also trust vehicles to know that they have spare tires and all the tools. Hopefully, the tires are aired up. It was. But it's, a, it's an opportunity that through, through a trial that we, he learned that, that people could be trusted in that moment. Now, of course, that breaks down, right? Because there's, there, there could easily come a mechanical failure on a car or whatever that I won't be able to fix because I'm not God. But in that moment, he learned that, okay, it's going to be all right. He doesn't have to have anxiety in that moment. And he now has this great fascination for finding where all these storage compartments are where people have spare tires. So if he's looking at your car, looking for a spare tire, that's, what, that's all he's doing. So, so trust is often built through these trials. Okay? Fast forward it to my own life, and, and I'm the one in the, uh, the, with the lesson to learn. About 10 days ago, uh, I had to go work on a furnace that was not working. And so what did I do? I did the only logical thing, and that was to call my dad, Glenn Van Zee, because he is incredibly mechanically minded. And so uh, we began to work on this and couldn't quite figure out what was going on with this furnace and why it wouldn't light. I even ended up on the roof, which is not safe when there's snow and ice, but praise the Lord for his safety and protection. 
After running diagnostics, looking at the error codes, and about three hours later, it still wasn't working. But I still had the confidence in my dad, knowing that he has fixed about everything I've ever seen in my life, that he's going to get this thing running before we leave that night. And sure enough, before we left, we figured it out, he figured it out, and got it running. Okay, Just short of MacGyver, he was able to get that thing running, and it's still running. So uh, why do I tell that story? Because past experiences have proven to me that he is able to fix those things. And of course, again, I apologize for a, a story that's relatable like that because, because any story that we try to connect falls short of our Heavenly Father, right? We know that our Heavenly Father is truly perfect, and uh, we, know that, we know that he will never fail us. He will never fail us. Okay? Paul had this relationship with Jesus Christ, that no matter what situation he was in, he had complete trust and faith, knowing that God had it all under control. Be it a shipwreck, prison, in the midst of any circumstances, he knew that God was in control, and to the point that he could even sing praises while he was in the Philippian prison. As I looked at the order of service and I saw the songs that we were going to sing, I saw that we were going to sing the song, It Is Well, and I thought to myself, what a, what a powerful, powerful song. And as we sing hymns like that, they're often even more powerful when we know the story behind them. And so I don't know if you all know the story between the writing, behind, behind the writing of It Is Well, but I want to tell that story real quick. And, and Horatio Spafford is, 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 was the writer of that hymn. So I'm just going to read this real quick, the story behind that hymn. Rachel Spafford knew something about life's unexpected challenges. He was a successful attorney and a real estate investor who lost a fortune in the great Chicago fire of 1871. Around the same time, his beloved four-year-old son died of scarlet fever. Thinking a vacation would do his family some good, he sent his wife and four daughters on a ship to England planning to join them after he finished some pressing business at home. However, while crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the ship was involved in a terrible collision and sunk. More than 200 people lost their lives, including all four of Horatio Spafford's precious daughters. His wife, Anna, survived the tragedy. Upon arriving in England, she sent a telegram to her husband that began, Saved alone, what shall I do? Horatio immediately set sail for England, at one point during his voyage, the captain of the ship, aware of the tragedy that struck the Spafford family, summoned Horatio to tell him that they were now passing over the spot where the shipwreck had occurred. As Horatio thought about his daughters, words of comfort and hope filled his heart and mind, and he wrote them down, and they have since become the well-beloved hymn, When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Perhaps we cannot always say that everything is well in, aspects of all, in all aspects of our lives. There will always be storms to face and sometimes there will be tragedies. But with faith in a loving God, with trust in his divine help, we can confidently say, it is well, it is well with my soul. So how can Horatio Spafford be able to respond this way? How can Paul respond the way that he does. They knew that no matter what happened to them in this life, that the eternal outcome was already taken care of. Because of that, their anxiety was more or less gone. They experienced the peace of God that we see spoken of in this text. You see flat tires, broken furnaces, heartache from lo lost loved ones, financial struggles, these things do happen. So I'm not going to tell you that this next year is going to be perfect and flawless. It's not going to be, okay? The struggle's real, but there is hope, okay? When Paul penned the words in Romans 10, verse 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God saved him from the, de from the dead, you will be saved. You see, Paul recognized that those words provided his eternal salvation. And it also provided help for him in the current situations. We see that Paul was surrounded by other believers, okay, other believers that encouraged him with those truths, reminded him of what Jesus Christ 
did for him. When Paul told the Philippian jailer, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, he meant every word of it because he knew that was the only thing in that moment that mattered. As I close today and as we face 2023, I recognize that not everyone is living in this peace and security. You see, if you're not placing your trust in Jesus Christ, you can't expect to find this peace in anything else. It's only in Jesus Christ that we will find this peace that we are talking about. If that's you, it is my prayer that today that you would find salvation in Jesus Christ. And if that's you, I pray that you find someone, a believer in Jesus Christ, to talk to, be it me or anyone else who believes in Jesus Christ, I encourage you to have that conversation today because I want that peace for each and every one of you. For those who are trusting in Jesus Christ, praise the Lord, okay? Praise the Lord. And we can face any trial, any year with confidence, okay? But I encourage you guys, and I hope that you guys, as we see Paul encouraging other believers, I, I hope that this year that you, too, will encourage one another. You see, as we go through life's struggles, we're not meant to do this alone. We live in a difficult, sinful, fallen world. There are challenges out there. I encourage each and every one of you to be an encouragement, to remind one another of what Christ has done in your life, what God's Word says about His faithfulness. I encourage you, join Bible studies, attend church, pray for one another, share with one another what Christ is doing in your lives. We've got to rub shoulders with other Christians, right? It benefits all of us. And so, we're all in this together. Remind each other of what Christ has done for us. I pray that no matter what we face in this upcoming year, I pray that we would recognize that the Lord is near and He is the answer. Would you please bow your heads and pray with me? Jesus, we just thank You for this powerful Word. We thank You for the truth that it is that we can face uh, any struggle this year, Lord, with, with confidence that you have taken care of our greatest need, but you also meet us right where we are. We praise you for that. And so, Jesus, we just I just pray for each individual in here and just their relationship with you. If they do not have one, Lord, I pray that, that they would come to know you in a personal relationship today. Father, we praise you. We love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, at this time, I'm going to invite Pastor Clay up to do communion. Thanks for your work in feeding us this morning, Levi. Uh, so good to have you share with us this morning. We're now going to celebrate uh, communion together this morning. And before we partake, I just want to take us to one verse this morning to really center us around what we're, what we're celebrating, what we're remembering um, in this moment. And the verse is Isaiah 53, 5. It's a common verse. Um, I'm sure we've all heard it. And it is prophecy that Jesus would fulfill on the cross. I believe it will be on the screen for you as well. I just want to read it for us as we remember the broken body and the shed blood of, of Christ. Speaking of Jesus, but he was pierced for our transgressions. Blood was um, shed for our transgressions. He, Jesus, was crushed for our iniquities. Body was broken for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed at, at the cross, th there was a body broken for our iniquities. It was broken in our place. At the cross, there was blood shed for our transgressions. It was shed in our place. At the cross, there is peace. At the cross, we are healed. At the cross, everything changes and so we remember and we celebrate what Jesus accomplished for us this morning. And so um, the men who are going to serve us this morning can go ahead and come forward if they haven't already. 
Um, but, but before we partake, as, as the men are coming forward, Larry's going to play for us um, as well. Uh, but let, let's just put ourselves right at the foot of the cross. Um, let's run there for the peace Levi talked about this morning. Let's run there for forgiveness. Let's run there for strength. Let's, let's run there for grace. So we're going to take time to reflect. We're going to examine ourselves as, as the trays are passed. And um, after everyone is served, I will come back up and lead us and we'll partake together. Um, but finally, before we do that, I just want to say if you're a Christian in the room, um, we, we would love for you to join us in partaking, whether you're part of this church or not. We'd love for you to join. If you are not yet a Christian, um, we would ask you to just let the tray pass by you, and that is 100% okay. Okay, You're not an outcast. Um, 100% okay. We just believe this is a meal for Christians, and, and we love that you're here. Okay, and we would love for you to consider what Levi has said this morning. We would love for you to think about what we just saw of the cross in Isaiah 53 and then to just simply trust it this morning. Trust it in faith. Um, if you're a parent, we do allow you to make the choice if your children should partake or not with us. Okay, so these men are going to pass out the trays for us this morning, and then I'll come back up and lead us, and we'll partake together.
if you go ahead and grab the, the wafer cup there on the bottom. I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians 11 for us. Starting in verse 23, Apostle Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's eat together. Continuing in verse 25. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. Amen. As you, as you leave today, there'll be a little trash can out there. Would you just throw your, your plastic cups out there? That'd be helpful. Let me pray for us, and then we're going to end. Larry will lead us in how great is our God this morning. God, you are so good to us. We thank you for our morning. God, we thank you for the word that was brought through Levi. Thank you for strengthening him today. God, we thank you for your peace. Oh, it's what we're all searching for. God, it's found in Christ. He was pierced for us. He was crushed for us. By his wounds, we are healed. God, may that be the cry, the banner of, of all of us as we leave today, whether we came in with that banner or not, to pray that that would be the banner as we leave. Um, we trust you, and in response, we simply sing, how great is our God this morning. We love you, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand, church, as we sing this morning.
for anything because you know, you see, and understand all things in our lives. Father, we praise you and thank you for today. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, I'd like to give the benediction from Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. It says, For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present nor things to come, nor powers, nor height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hope you all have a blessed day.